The Jacobite uprising of 1745 to 6 had shaken the British state to its core. It could never be allowed to happen again. And the British government took measures up here to ensure that it didn't. After the Battle of Culloden, the British government decided to throw everything they had at it, and they built the most remarkable fortress in 18th century Britain. It's still perfectly intact there. It's called Fort George, and it is one of my favourite places to come to anywhere in the British Isles. It was designed to be a bastion of Hanoverian rule in the unruly north of Britain. They spent on this massive fortress the equivalent of one year of Scotland's GNP. This was, at the time considered, the best fortress in the UK. So I've come outside the walls of this fortress now, and the first thing you notice about it is how low-lying it is. You can hardly see this mighty fort, and yet it's one of the most powerful forts built in Europe at this time. And that low-lying nature is absolutely deliberate because it's designed for artillery. This is a castle, but for the age of cannon. So any cannon out, outside this fort firing in, first of all, the first obstacle is this glassy here, which is a very gently sloping up surface here, wide open so there's nowhere to hide if you're attacking it, and cannonballs shot at the walls of the fort would hit this, skim off, harm, harmlessly just bounce off over it. So the glassy is the first defensive feature. Then we come on through here and there's something called a covered way. This is basically trench warfare, but you know, a couple of centuries before the World War I. Look at this. It's, it's a parapet, you're designed to stand here, infantrymen standing behind this stockade, can shoot over these walls, at, down the glassy, so any attacking infantry are wiped out in a, in a total killing field. Look at all the different angles. All of these angles, it's, it's a classic star-shaped fort. What I love about this fort so much is this, there are less than 15 star-shaped forts in Britain, uh, and, and that's deliberate because most of the fighting that had occurred in the British Isles was before this era, this technology of star-shaped forts. They, that's why we've got so many medieval castles. But this one's different because it was built so late in the 1750s and 60s, it used this new technology that you usually only see elsewhere in Europe. So these star-shaped angles meant that every single field of fire was covered. Cannon could shoot down the length of all the walls. There were no blind spots at all. It's beautifully symmetrical. So then we get to the first ditch. We say goodbye to the covered way here where infantrymen can run around the edge and, and uh, be out of sight of the enemy the whole time. We get to the first huge ditch. With This would have been a drawbridge. And we cross through into what looks like the mighty ramparts of the fort. But it's not. This is only an outer fortification. It's called a ravelin. It's like a little island of of, it's like a little island fortress all by itself, protecting the main access to the rest of the fort. Come through here. Big strong gates, of course. Just look how thick these walls are. A medieval castle might have walls even three or four meters thick, but this is 20 or 30 meters thick, designed for pounding by the heaviest artillery at the time. And only when you get out here do you realize that this was just a a small island fortification, if you like, then you've got the proper moat, and beyond that, the actual main entrance to the fort itself. This, if it had been attacked, the attacking force, even if they'd managed to overrun this, can you imagine how disheartening it would be to suddenly see that ahead of you? So that's the arrow-shaped ravelin behind me now, and I'm crossing the enormous ditch. This could have been flooded when the enemy approached, so it would have been a huge obstacle. Crossing this ditch are these, are these drawbridges. There would have been two back in the 18th century. And only then do you realize the brutal weight of crossfire that any attacking force would have under here. Just look at these. You've got cannons mounted there, optimized to cover this zone here, turning it into an absolute killing field. There are no blind spots on this fort. And the size of these ramparts are very significant. But of course, from out there, you don't see them because of the gently sloping uh, glassy. So finally, I've got to the principal gate. That through there is the inside of the fortress itself. 
And right up here, look at this, George II's coat of arms. And that was very deliberate. This had a military purpose, but it also had a very powerful political purpose. It was designed to show the people of the Highlands that that man, George II, the man who gave his name to this fort, George, was their king and not the exiled Stuart family. You could have been in no doubt coming through here that this regime was firmly in charge of this part of Scotland. Entering the principal gate now, these gates are the original gates of this fortress, 250 years old. They are still closed every single night because this is still a working military base used by the British Army to this day. These are another set of gates that would have added an extra level of protection. And then finally, after passing through these incredibly thick ramparts here, we're out in the centre of the fort where the barracks and the working buildings would have been. This is the truly remarkable heart of this fort. It's the barracks square. The buildings all around this square pretty much unchanged since they were completed, this one, in 1757. This is a true time capture. It's a very, very special fortification, this, because it was never attacked, so it was never, parts of it were never destroyed, it was never rebuilt, and also because the army were custodians of it, all the way from when it was created 250 years ago, right up into the present day, when it still acts as a barracks. As a result, it's been frozen in time. It's truly one of our national treasures. Fort George is defended by around about a mile of star-shaped wall and burrowed into those walls are bomb-proof rooms like this, accommodation, storerooms, they're called casemates and they would have had something like 40 men able to stay here in the event of a siege. So they would have had to leave their nicer airy barracks out there because of mortar shells, cannonballs potentially landing and they'd have come in here where they've been safe as houses. There's some slits there for light and ventilation and then a fireplace here to keep you warm on those cold highland days. If this place had ever come under siege it would have been pretty grim in here. The ground would have shaken, the dust would have fallen out between these bricks, the pounding it would have received and there'd have been 40 men in here. The smell would have been bad, sanitation wouldn't have been great but they'd have been safe. In the northern wall, there's what's called a sally port, which is a narrow entrance through which the defenders can emerge and disrupt the siege. This is the northern sally port, and you can tell that in the event of the attackers managing to get in here, it, was, it would have been a killing zone. These slits go through to the casements, and they've been able to shoot and kill any attackers that made it this far. But this is a particularly special place. It's not, you're not allowed here as a member of the public, but the museum have kindly let me have a look at this because here on the gate of this sally port, there's some extraordinary graffiti from different periods. Squaddies over the years leaving their mark. 1781, absolutely magical. I said it before, I'll say it again. Nothing connects you with the people that have gone before through this space than, than the graffiti they left behind. It feels very, very human. Finally, up here on the top of the ramparts, we get the cannon. Now these would have, they would have had about 70 cannon surrounding the walls of this fort, all carefully sighted so there was not a single blind spot anywhere along these walls. If you look out through these embrasures, you can see the cannon were designed to fire solid round shot cannonballs, if you like, at any ships that might be approaching. But they could also be loaded with something called canister shot, which was a canister of, say, musket balls, which you'd push in, fire out, and that would turn each one of these cannon into a giant shotgun, which could have a devastating effect on any attacking infantryman. These are called pepper pots. They are sentry posts which are pushed out. So they're actually outside the ramparts. So from up here, 
you can see everything going on outside the walls. There is not one place where an enemy can sneak up to the walls and start making preparations to scale them. I'm standing now at the western tip of this massive fortress and you can see from here exactly why the military planners put it here. Just down there, this is the Moray Firth, down there is the city of Inverness. That was the most important settlement in the Highlands in the 18th century. You can see where the mountains form a sort of valley down there. That's the so-called Great Glen. Loch Ness runs the way through it. That's like an artery that runs right through the Highlands, dividing it in half. And the plan of the British government was to put a ring of steel down the Great Glen. Starting here, which blocked off its northeast end, forts all the way down and out to Fort William on the far side. Never again would the Highlands be lost to the British Crown. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel, which we are relaunching. We've got all the best exclusive content going straight onto this History Hit YouTube channel. And you can find out, for example, why on earth I'm standing at the top of this mast. You should probably subscribe.